Hi guys, this is uh, another video for Unit 2, Atomic Structure and Electron Configuration. Same thing, this is a really um, interesting unit because if you look at the learning outcomes, they're pretty big ones. And to me, it's always easier to kind of tackle um, some of these learning outcomes if you know why should we care and what the background is. And so this is just a really short uh, discussion of the couple of first atomic um, models and so we just you should have just finished the video on atomic structure this is the video on the Bohr model which is based off what they knew about the atom so here's where we are going to um, be for the moment we're gonna take what we know about atoms and really discuss one of the first atomic theories. Now this is kind of one of the most difficult concepts you're going to deal with all semester and that is because here we have to think of electrons as both matter and light and it just kind of doesn't make sense and so this is one of the few times where I say just accept don't try to understand all of it and so Comprehend what you can, and then what you can't, just accept it as truth. Now, the first thing I want to really bring to your attention is if you've ever seen a rainbow, and around here, I've seen several lately, um, just with the, the amount of rain and the clouds, it's just been awesome. But if you've ever had, like, a grandma with one of those little crystal things in her window that sprinkles, you know, rainbows around her kitchen, or um, if you go into a jewelry store, you can usually take a diamond and shine white light through it and you get a rainbow. And so that's called a continuous spectrum where you have, you know, red bleed into um, orange, which bleeds into yellow. There's no real break in color. And that is a continuous spectrum where you can kind of see where they blend together. And the idea here is it shows all of the wavelengths of light that are visible to us. Now there is some debate at the moment over how much of how many wavelengths really could be seen you know years and years ago. If you go back to the 18th century there is no real discussion of uh, the sky being blue if you look at their poetry, their, their literature. Instead, the sky was always gray. Now, that could be because they're pessimistic, but the other theory is there may have been fewer wavelengths that our eyes could detect. And so, anyway, the idea is red bleeds to orange, which bleeds to yellow, which bleeds to green, and so on and so on, and you get a nice continuous spectrum here. A line spectrum, on the other hand, is where you have only certain wavelengths are visible. And this is a kind of... Titan. Titan. Stupid. Thank you. Uh, this is the way that we have been studying um, light for uh, really about 100 years. Probably a little bit before then, but it became most prevalent about 100 years ago. Okay. Now, the way that this works, come on, is you have white light, you pass it through some prism, you know, water acts as a prism, too, because of the diffraction uh, gradient that it does. Um, and you end up getting a nice rainbow. Now, if you, on the other hand, look at a discontinuous spectrum, here's what a discontinuous spectrum is. You don't see all of these colors. Instead, you see a couple of different wavelengths. And so the idea is you have the an electron that is being excited and then it, as it comes back down it releases energy as light that we can see and because we're only seeing certain ones um, only certain transitions are allowed now what does that really mean hold on a second as we Okay, I wanted to go ahead and look up the name, and I just I could not remember. So this really comes around from uh, the mid-19th century, 
when it was found that not only do these discontinuous spectra exist, but that they are completely unique to uh, every element. And so it's almost like a DNA fingerprint for elements. And so it's kind of interesting because this is where the Bohr model comes from. You can kind of see here it has a nucleus, an electron orbiting around the nucleus, and the idea is if the electron, let me go forward a little bit, you don't need all the detailed explanation, is absorbing light and then comes back down, it is going to, where did it go? Put off light that corresponds to something. And so because that light is being absorbed, what's going to end up happening is you end up getting an absence of that wavelength in this, the spectra. And so like if it, did, it was a blue wavelength that was being absorbed, you just wouldn't see that blue. And so it's kind of, you know, it goes back to, you know, roses are red, violets are blue. Well, they're not really. Roses are red because they absorb every color except red and they shine red back at you. They're really absorbing some other wavelength here. Now, guys, I cannot tell you, this is a instrumental, amazing discovery that we give about 30 seconds in class. This discovery changed everything in astronomy. Uh, there were two women, Annie Jump Cannon and then Cecilia Payne, and I cannot say her married name, so it's just going to be Cecilia Payne and then, you know, uh, either way. But they both worked um, in the mid to late 19th century and then uh, Cecilia Payne actually worked until you know uh, really right up until World War II I think. Now she is um, they both really worked in astronomy and what they really worked with is by taking these fingerprinted line spectra, they were able to look at the composition of stars. Now until that time it was assumed that stars were composed primarily of metal. They were rock. You know that's what everyone thought. And so by being able to take pictures and look through diffraction gradients they were able to really determine that the primary composition of stars is hydrogen and helium more than anything else. And um, it was groundbreaking, pretty controversial. I can't imagine, you know, what they went through. Um, but, you know, fortunately they were at uh, pretty prestigious universities. Uh, Cecilia Payne was actually at Harvard, and so she probably had a little bit of clout because of that. So again guys what this really means is you have an electron. Now sometimes it's easier to think of the nucleus and an orbital is kind of circular. The electron jumps up to an orbital as it absorbs a wavelength of light. As it comes back down you get to see that the, the wavelength of light that corresponds to that energy. Now this isn't going to be on the exam. But what is going to be on the exam is where are the electrons? How are they functioning? And as we get into the electron configuration, it's going to make more sense if you kind of think about the Bohr model for a little bit. Now, Bohr said, you know, the nucleus contains, you know, protons, positively charged, and neutrons, no charge, particles with orbitals that circular, circular, circu that circle the nucleus. Um, the electrons are going to be in those orbitals. The orbitals must be circular and the ground state is given a, you know, a step of one. Um, and you can kind of think about this in terms of, um, you know, almost like, do I have the picture on the next one? Yes, a ladder. You can step here and you can step here. But if you ever kind of misjudged a step and you've tried to step like right in the middle, you know that that doesn't work. And so just like an electron, our foot wouldn't go in between those orbitals. You're going to kind of fall until your foot reaches ground. The electron can either be in this orbital or this orbital, not in between. Okay? 
So the, the Bohr model really did work for hydrogen. It ascertained that electrons exist, they exist in orbitals, and orbitals have to be in specific spots. You can't just be all willy-nilly anywhere. The problem with that is it only works with hydrogen because other elements have non-circular orbitals, okay? And so we really needed a new model for the atom that kind of took the Bohr model and elaborated it on it a little bit. So that is where we are leading off into the quantum mechanical model. It's going to be good.